We're going to be answering your questions. It's a very special episode, and that's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. We're joined today by Dr. Tiffany Doherty, who is a PhD in neuroscience and joined the healthcare triage team last July. She's been helping to write episodes, uh, produce episodes, do all kinds of stuff. Tiffany, welcome. Thank She's you. She's also going to be reading your questions. That's her job today. Yes. Okay. Nice to meet you all. All right. So first of all, a lot of people ask this. Um, Mr. Big Noodle has asked it a couple of times. Okay. So we have learned a lot about the dangers of smoking from observational trials. So why is it that, especially here at Healthcare Triage, we're always saying that you cannot do the same with nutrition and disease? Okay. Well, first of all, with some things, it would be unethical to, to do a randomized controlled trial. Smoking is probably one. But it's of important course. to know that a lot of this is because some of the other things we've talked about, the absolute value of the risk on top of the you know, relative risk. And even here, the relative risk, a lot of times when we're talking about something in an episode and we're saying, well, does this really matter? The relative risk is like 1.1, meaning that the overall risk increase is maybe 10% in a relative way. So what's a relative risk if there's no risk at all? It'd be one. So it'd be the same. So one is the same. Yeah. The difference is that for smoking, for some things, it's like smoking, you know, pack a day or whatever, has a relative risk of like 150, not 1.2, but like your risk goes up by like 15, what is that, 15,000%? I don't know, but it's it's 150 times what it was, not 1.2 times what it was. It's so massive that we can't possibly ignore it. It's just so big. And so then the absolute risks are like so much larger that even in an observational trial, we're so concerned because this thing is so massively large that we're like, this is this really looks like it's real. Like it, it can't even, no matter how much controlling you do for other things, it's a massive, huge, super important risk factor. So what are some examples of the ethical problems we could have? Well, when you have a risk that, that, that that's, that's that large, it becomes then problematic to say that we're going to randomize people to then check to see if it's true just because we want to be sure. Um, and it's also the fact that like smoking is incredibly addictive. So if we randomize people to smoke for the purposes of a trial, they may not be able to stop. Yeah. And it's not like eating. Well, eat, I guess we could even make some of the argument, but this is clearly super duper addictive and it would not be right to start people on it with the idea that they could just stop later. And then what about ethical issues in like the nutrition? Why can't I take a group and say I could make them eat steak every day, all day? So you can't make them. What you can do is try to ask them to. Um, and what happens even in trials when we ask people to, they don't stick to the diet. Yeah. Um, and so it's very hard to get people to say, we're only going to eat meat for three years or you're going to only eat vegetables for three years and then make sure that they do. The one way that we can do that, and unfortunately has been done, is some of these studies have been conducted on institutionalized individuals um, where people don't get to control what they eat. But then that's also, how ethical is that? Especially if, you know, if they are prisoners, it's unethical in the sense that like, is it really right that we use prisoners and researchers because we can? But oftentimes they do it on institutionalized individuals who are either sick or have issues that make them unable to properly consent. And that's unethical for all, a whole bunch of other reasons. Someone asked, why do we discuss results from observational trials in episodes like sleeping, but then we really kind of demonize them so much in the nutrition studies here? So again, it's important to think about the the relative risks and the absolute and the absolute risks, and then also to talk about, you know, how much of a change are we asking people to make and what benefit are they going to get versus what are the harms. So with respect to diet, the problem is that we've conducted massive, huge studies over and over and over again. We have a pretty good sense of what the absolute risks are, and they're very small. And yet people come out with pronouncements and say, everyone must do this for health. That's overreaching. On the other hand, it's probably fine to say, well, it looks like people who sleep more tend to do better for this or that reason. Um, you might want to think about sleeping more. We don't pass guidelines saying, change the world so that everybody gets eight hours sleep. We say, you might want to consider this personal change. And if the benefits turn out to be good for you, great. And if they don't, I'm totally fine with that. I'd be fine if that's how nutrition recommendations went out too, but they don't. They come out with these massive, like huge, you must do this versus, well, maybe with this. I would also say that 
the sleep studies and some of the observational stuff, they're small and we're still in the realm of like, we're not sure, let's go follow this up perhaps with some RCTs or by doing bigger and bigger and better studies. And we've been seeing a lot of that with respect to changing school start times for reasons. And we're following up that with better and better quality studies to try and get at what does this actually do. Um, when we do that a lot of times with food, it, it goes against what we think we're going to see with the observational data so far with sleep and the sleep times, the stuff we're getting in better and better high quality studies backs up what we're seeing in the observational data. And so we're more inclined to believe it. Okay. Sounds great. Okay. So vitamin D, I know you really love vitamin D. Okay. Yeah. Um, so someone, actually a few people wanted to know if vitamin D supplements don't work, why does my doctor prescribe them? And then someone else also wanted to know, um, don't you need it if you never see the sun? So the first question was there, why, look, why are doctors still prescribing? I'd ask them? him. I'd ask your doctor why he or she is still prescribing because I don't know. Um, now, part of it is like, let's be honest, doctors are people too. And uh, lots of people believe that vitamin D works. And, you know, this is a hugely contested thing, even in the medical world. You're getting my read of the literature, which I will argue and back up. And should your doctor ever come and be sitting next to me, I'd have this debate. I think I'd win it because the evidence behind it is pretty clear that for the vast majority of reasons people are using vitamin D, the evidence just isn't there to support it. Okay. Um, having said that, if there's a reason and your physician can explain it to you and maybe it's just a belief and you should, fine, like the risks are often low. I'm not here to yuck anyone's yum if they if they truly want to do it. But I would push and ask because I don't think the evidence is really there. Okay. The second question was about never seeing the sun. Yes. Yeah. That, yes, if you never see the sun, then there could be an argument. But even in those cases, it's not necessarily clear that, you know, still that taking vitamin supplementation is the cure or going to fix that problem in the way that we would like it to. Because we randomize, we do RCTs of supplementing people with vitamins. And even in places where different climates and different amounts of sun, we're just not seeing big differences, if any, in the people that get supplemented to make us think that it's such a good idea. Okay. So try Staticus. Um, on one of our YouTube videos wants to know if you would recommend sports drinks for feverish symptoms or athletic performance. Well, sports drinks for, fe uh, I mean, I'm trying to even think like, well, I thought they were gonna say, so look, if you're dehydrated, you should hydrate and sports drinks are fine. They're just not proven to be really any better than then. lots of other stuff, including water, unless okay. you're massively dehydrated. I mean, like clinically dehydrated. Um, uh, even then, I don't know, but for feverish symptoms, I'm like, it's not going to help with a fever. It's not going to help with chills or aches or anything else. That, I mean, it's not going to do any of that. It's just really about hydration. And so I don't know. Just drink some water? Yeah. For the most part, usually okay. you're going to be fine with water. What okay. was the second part of the question, though? Um, athletic performance. Oh, yeah. There's no evidence for that. Like, I mean, it's again, it's like if you're so dehydrated that you're clinically dehydrated and we need to be rehydrating, rehydrating you with some kind of like saline-ish solution instead of just water, you probably shouldn't be participating in academic, I mean, athletic activities anyway. So, no, I don't really think there's really any real evidence that shows that it's it makes you a better athlete at all. Okay. Scotty Awesome Sauce wants to know why he was told that he does not have celiac, but that he should still avoid gluten. He does feel a lot better avoiding gluten. His diarrhea went away, he can focus. So if gluten sensitivity doesn't exist, then why has going gluten-free gluten helped him? I can't tell you, look here, look, I can't tell you specifically, like here's the thing. Um, we know that every time we treat anyone for anything, um, and they get an effect. Some portion of that is placebo effect and some portion of that is an actual effect. And I don't even say biologic effect because placebo effect is biologic, but some effect that is due to whatever it is the treatment is. Um, for some things, it's massively placebo effect, maybe a tiny of this. For some things, it's a lot of this and maybe little placebo effect, but there's always some. Like on almost every control group, there are still people that get better. Like. That's cl clearly placebo effect. That's not because of anything else we did. So why probably, and this is where I hate these kinds of questions because again, I'm yucking your yum. If you're getting a placebo effect, I'm thrilled. Go. I'm not asking you to change your diet with Scotty Awesome Sauce. I'm really not. If this makes you happy, I'm thrilled. And that is awesome sauce. The problem is when you proselytize and start telling other people that they should do it, there's no evidence for that. 
And if they're not going to get the placebo effect, you just sent them down a pathway where they might be getting harms, including loss of joy, and not any benefit. So why? Probably placebo effect. That's the truth. Now, I can't be guaranteed that 100%. But again, if you're happy, I'm happy. Feel free to keep doing it. Okay, Robert Guthrie on Facebook has been looking around for reliable information on blue light filters and is curious um, what your thoughts are on the literature on evidence that blue light from screens is damaging to a person's eyes. Does it affect sleep? And then using any kind of adjustments, so like um, changing the blue light with filters or glasses, is that helpful? So there are some studies that will show a benefit. There are even some systematic reviews that gather studies together and will argue that there is a benefit, but they all have caveats in the, fence of the, in the sense that the studies are not terribly high quality or large or with long-term outcomes or anything else. So this is another thing where I'm like, go ahead. The cost <laughs> is minimal. Probably doesn't have much in the way of harms. And if you feel like it's making a good difference in your life, that's fine. But again, I would not, I would caution that we shouldn't start telling other people to do this because the evidence to back it up is pretty slim. Um, and again, you can find a study. It's just not enough to say like, this is how we should actually tell people to behave. Okay. Okay, Jeff W. Um, says, there's a growing movement at the healthcare facility I work in to stop wearing neckties. The thought is that they can spread germs and disease as they are never cleaned. Are neckties spreading contagion or are people just looking for an excuse to dress casual? No, no, I think that there's a, there's a really valid concern there. Um, it's the same reason that white coats are not such a great idea, yes, but we still use them. Coats. And people argue about that all the time. Neckties are just another wear place to collect stuff in between. We probably don't wash them enough. And so they can. No, I think this is a totally valid point. Um, right. Having said that, it's very hard to break societal norms. And if you're asking like why I'm wearing a tie, it's because I'm not tech, I'm not seeing patients most days of the week. And my office or work environment has not been as enlightened as this and probably <laughs> still thinks that this is the way the professionals dress. Um, but that's a societal construct and it was not designed for health reasons. Allison McWaters was asking us on Facebook. She was looking at a book on Audible, and her BS alarm bells are going off. Um, I really love BS alarm bells. Yes. We have those at Healthcare Triage all the time. Um, she was wondering what your thoughts are then on this book. Um, you have actually written about this in your book. Um, it's called Grain Brain. Oh, yeah. The Surprising Truth About Wheat, Carbs, and Sugar, Your Brain's Silent Killers. Yeah. So before you answer... Just in case anyone doesn't know about this book, I just want to read the Amazon description. Okay. So, a renowned neurologist exposes a finding that's been buried in the medical literature. Carbs are destroying your brain. Even so-called healthy carbs like whole grains and whole plant food starches can cause dementia, ADHD, epilepsy, anxiety, chronic headaches, depression, decreased libido, and more. Also, statin drugs might be erasing your memory. Oh, wow, that was thoughts? a tangent. That was a so look. The, my the big issue as soon as they say cause, like they're not doing randomized controlled trials in human beings to see if anything or these things are happening. Look, we've covered so many episodes, and if anyone has read my book, yeah, I'm going to disagree with that. I don't think that I don't think anyone's been bearing the evidence, and I don't think that it's shown in any way that carbs are destroying your brain. Again, carbs are necessary for life. I mean, glucose is a necessary thing to live, um, and. Uh, Every other animal model exists where they do consume, you know, some kind of sugars. Now, granted, they're not all eating refined carbohydrates and making bread. Um, we do that, but we've been doing that for a long time without any major decrease or terrible outcome. In fact, all of those things that you described are almost the, it's the best it's ever been in terms of our ability to treat those things and, and keep people from getting them for a long period of time. So trying to argue that somehow, you know, our ability to eat bread uh, has been horrifically bad for the human race and resulted in terrible death and illness, it's, the, the evidence just is not there. Okay, so I think we should give our kudos to Allison for having yes. excellent BS. Yes, I, yes, I'm not endorsing, I'm not endorsing. <laughs> okay, okay, this next person, um, wrote in with our with our viewer question doc that we had up a while ago and they under their name said I will keep this anonymous so do they might feel them? a little embarrassed oh I see like do I know okay go ahead no no it seems like they think their question is silly okay um, they actually said this is probably a silly question mm -hmm. but I have nowhere else to ask okay That's fine it's what we're here for does the amount of cow's milk you drink as a kid influence how much breast milk you can give to your baby I'm I, I'm trying to even think what the mechanics of this are so how much 
How so much cow's milk that a woman drinks I influences so. how much milk she can make? Yes. So no. a woman as a child. No, as a child. No. No, not not even as an adult. No. No, I, I know of no oh. link at all. Okay. None. Okay, so Troy on Facebook wants to know if it's better to cook vegetables or eat them raw. And if that is the case for only some vegetables, which ones? Um, how do you like them? That's really probably the only thing that matters. Okay. Still I, get the same nutrients if well, you have a steamed carrot I mean, versus a raw. This is, again, where it's like you probably could do some study which can show some statistically significant difference one way or the other. But I swear to God, if you're eating vegetables, we should only be thrilled, <laughs> not be concerned about how you're preparing them. I, that's the win. More vegetables, good. I don't, I'm not going to argue that one way of preparing vegetables is bad. And you're doing it wrong if you're not doing it that way. There are raw vegetables I enjoy. There are cooked vegetables I enjoy. It's all good. Plus, if- raw vegetables are not, I mean, cooked vegetables are sometimes better because they've been prepared with seasoning that makes them taste good. That's what makes stuff taste good. And so, you know, don't force people to eat raw vegetables if they don't like the taste and they're more likely to eat cooked vegetables. I'd rather them eat vegetables. What if I bread and deep fat fry my broccoli? It's, you're now making it slightly less good than before, but... Still better still than eating my broccoli? broccoli, I suppose. I mean, I'd rather you you didn't try to make it worse. Um, but I'm trying to think, like, what a, what a good analogy of this is. Like, I... Uh, I wouldn't turn down deep fried, you know, vegetables if they were delicious. But it's probably not the way you want to eat them every day. Okay. Nati from Israel wants to know, is wearing face masks in public places such as trains something that results in better health outcomes? Well, okay, first of all, it depends what you mean by better health, better health outcomes, but it also depends why and how you're wearing the mask. Like, a lot of people wear the mask in certain cultures because they know they could be sneezing or making other people sick. Fair. In that case, yes, because like if you're containing the droplets or anything else you might spray all over the place, that's being very polite. Like, sure. If, however, you think you're going to prevent yourself from catching something, that's not as likely. Now, it might be as likely if it prevents you from touching your face, Mm. but you're probably touching the mask and then making the mask infected, and then you're now keeping it right in front of yourself. So I don't know about that. So in in the sense of preventing yourself from getting ill, probably not a lot of evidence. Preventing others from getting ill, yes. Doctors wear masks when they operate, not to protect themselves, well, sometimes you got you could argue from blood in certain instances, but for the most part, it's to keep them from infecting the sterile environment. Uh-huh. That's why doctors are wearing masks to prevent them from transmitting, not as much to prevent the other direction, a little bit, but not as much. Okay. Um, same thing out in, in the world. If, if you're putting on a mask because you're sick and you don't want to get others sick, good on you. If you're putting it on because you're panicked that other people are going to get you sick, not really not a lot so of great. evidence. No. But in fact, that's the biggest issue is I think, I mean, there's a run on like these masks at the moment yes. because everyone's worried about coronavirus. Very few people are thinking, I have coronavirus and I want to make sure I don't transmit it. They're all <laughs> panicked. I could get coronavirus. And if I wear this mask, it's going to protect me. As I wrote and I've said, and we've talked about before, not a lot of evidence for that. Okay. All right. We probably, probably should stop, although I see there's a lot more questions there. Keep them coming. We'll do this again in the future. Thanks for watching. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy a previous episode where John and I answer your questions that you sent in. While we've got you, also consider liking and subscribing down below. Go to patreon.com slash healthcare triage, where you, like our research associate Joe Evans and our surgeon Admiral Sam, can help make the show bigger and better.